Rob, thanks so much for having us today out at IU. We're so excited to be here. Absolutely. It's our pleasure. Thanks for coming down to visit us. We're very glad to. And for those that are watching the video of us, can you start by giving us a little context about where we are and what, what we're seeing behind us? Sure. Well, we're in a secret undisclosed location, <laughs> uh, which was part of the intent of this building to look very nondescript. Um, so, it does. so you do know where you're at, but we've sworn you to secrecy on that, <laughs> and uh, we appreciate that. But behind us is uh, Indiana University's uh, research pod, um, and this is where all of the various uh, research computing, high-performance computing, storage, and networking components are. And directly behind you, of course, is Big Red 200, which is uh, IU's latest, most powerful supercomputing system. Um, it's a Cray-based system. It's uh, specifically designed to focus on artificial intelligence. So it's an all GPU-based system. And it's getting some maintenance today, as you can see. So we want to always keep it in great working order. Well, it's the prettiest computer I've ever seen. Well, we appreciate <laughs> that. Uh, <laughs> it looks great. It looks great. Well, thanks for having us. It's neat to be in this backdrop and get to see, yeah. um, get to see the supercomputer. I, I'll take it back to you and just start um, with the getting to hear a little bit about your journey. You've been at IU since 1998 um, up until now. So we'd love to hear a little bit about that story and how you got to your current role. Sure, sure. So uh, I was in the military before um, coming to IU. So I was in the United States Navy and I always tell folks my last three years I was stationed in Pearl Harbor, Hawaii. And when you live in Pearl Harbor, Hawaii and you're done living there, Indianapolis is where you want to come back to. There's no other place on the planet. So um, I had the opportunity to come back to my roots. I'm originally from Indiana. Uh, always loved Indianapolis. I think uh, the world of our great state. And, uh, you know, came back to IU. Quickly as a veteran, got involved on our Indianapolis campus with our Adaptive Educational Services Unit. Um, and so this was a partnership with the campus and the students of the Indianapolis campus to um, assist them with the various technologies of the day um, to ensure that they had uh, every opportunity to have equal experiences in the academic and research space as any of the other students. Neat. And then what's that look like now? Tell us a little bit about what you're responsible for currently. You know, it's almost identical yeah. um, to uh, 25 years ago. Uh, <laughs> we'll hold you to the math. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's, uh, it's been a wonderful experience. You know, I, I would say... That beginning opportunity really connected me with the students, um, and the students are absolutely the center of our universe here at IU. Um, it's what we're here for. Research doesn't happen without them. Um, education clearly doesn't happen without them. Uh, they're even one of the largest users of our supercomputing services. So, um, you know, anything and everything we do uh, is focused on them. Um, so that far it hasn't changed, it's just grown. Uh, we're a very large organization across the state, as you know. Um, all of our campuses, our Bloomington campus, beautiful where we are today, our flagship campus, the, the state's flagship public institution, um, now over 200 years old, hence the Big Red 200, um, and all of our regional campuses as well. So. I would say, you know, my initial start, my scope might not have been as large, but the focus was consistent. And now um, the breadth of the responsibilities are broader, um, but the focus is still uh, squarely on our students and their success. Awesome. It's great to hear. Obviously, you've got this extensive experience in the technology space over the last 25 years. And I'm curious what the significant trends that you've seen in digital adoption have looked like in the last several decades and how you think about those trends informing our future? No, it's a great question. Um, it has been a, quite an experience over the last 25 years. So, you know, I think back to uh, when I graduated high school and, uh, you know, the internet really came to be in 1990. So I went K through 12 without that scenario, without those resources, without that digital infrastructure available to me. Um, so I, I got to experience it firsthand versus reading about the history. Um, 2004, of course, was the year that Facebook came out. And uh, unless you were in higher education, you, you were likely unaware. So unless you were a college student, which was the minimum criteria to get an account in Facebook or working in higher education, you probably hadn't heard about that. Um, and it wasn't until 2007 when the first iPhone came to be 
and that kind of digital experience that someone my age kind of grew up through when cell phones didn't work so well. We actually started with pagers and we'd call you back on a landline. And you know, so kind of having lived those direct technological advances and experiences over the decades to where we are today. I mean, flat panel TVs didn't even exist. So when I was in college, overhead transparencies were still a very normal thing. Um, projectors were new. And so, you know, having lived and then supported ordered these in the higher education landscape over the last two and a half decades has been both exciting um, and an informative. And we look today to things like artificial intelligence and everyone thinks, you know, wow, this is the next, you know, this is going to disrupt everything. And, you know, I would say higher education more so than any other industry is very uniquely positioned and capable of uh, adapting to the changes in and the tools that humanity uses. Um, you know, I'm sure that our faculty, when slide rulers first came to be, were happy that, you know, it was that easy to do the calculations and then calculators hit the scene and, well, we have to completely redevelop the math courses and whatever else it might be. And now with chat GPT-4, um, AI, open AI, machine learning, we have to rethink, you know, is this an obstacle? Is this, you know, enabling things that we don't, um, support well or how do we take advantage of this in in ethically appropriate ways to advance education and learning and scholarly research um, and so i would say you know each one of those phases that either i experienced firsthand or i was a part of implementing at large scale at a big public r1 um, they've both been exciting and fun uh, and fulfilling from a career perspective um, and they've helped build upon each other. That's fantastic to hear. And I think you're making a great point that higher ed has had to reinvent and learn new ways of being throughout that whole time. So they really do have a leg up. Curious if you'd pull out any other things that make higher ed unique when you think about digital adoption. I mean, clearly the pandemic uh, is a period where um, digital ad adoption um, <laughs> happened at a pace that yes. none of us were prepared for. I think yes. we all went home on a Friday thinking you know, this is gonna be a, a couple of weeks and we came back uh, quite some time later uh, to a very changed experience. And you know, I, I would say we did things like online learning, students had those exposures and experiences, but it, it I would say catapulted us uh, in a way that typically in technology, we don't like to think thrust that onto our constituents um, without some preparation, without some training, without some information, awareness, and we simply didn't have that type of lead time. Um, and so you know, I, I would say it's a great example of we had to adapt. Um, we prefer to have the opportunity to choose to adapt, <laughs> yeah. but um, I think we're capable uh, uh, of handling both approaches. Yeah, that's great. I'm glad you bring up the pandemic because that certainly disrupted things in in many ways. I'm sure between kind of that era and maybe even before that, just talk a little bit about the infrastructure and digital resources that IU is committed to in the past few decades and how you've seen that enhance the student experience. I, I would say, you know, I use preparation without knowing that they were preparing for a global pandemic, really returned substantial dividends. Um, so, you know, Indiana University has the notoriety of establishing a learning management system in the late 90s. So one of my very first jobs when I came here in the late 90s was to work on a learning management system, and there was no commercially available solution. Broadband in the home was just beginning to make its way so this notion of online learning really was was foreign to a lot of folks. Um, and so IU was a pioneer in that space on the research side. They actually commercialized their product mm -hmm. um, to a great success for the faculty and researchers involved at IU and those efforts. Um, but that laid a foundation for our faculty at IU and in by proxy, our students then uh, taking courses from those faculty members to use online learning in late 90s, early 2000s. Um, and, you know, maybe it wasn't the most optimal experience at the time, <laughs> but it was definitely cutting edge. You know, it was our faculty pushing the envelope of what the technologies were capable of at the time. Um, 
you know, we were very fortunate video conferencing was something when I was in the military, I remember using video conferencing from Hawaii to Bangor, Maine, and thinking at the time it was magic. I mean, it was just unbelievable in the mid 90s that we were having real time meetings over video, but it was the Department of Defense. Um, and so they had the latest, greatest everything. But then when I came to IU and saw that we were we were exploring it in the non military space and using it successfully, maybe with some hiccups and bumps. Um, we were very early adopters of things like Zoom. So IU had embraced um, video in the classroom space, both the presentation and the capture, three, four years before the pandemic. So, you know, unlike many of our peers who had to pivot to uh, obtain and implement video conferencing solutions, we'd been using it for years prior. Um, and so I think those examples where IU faculty um, whether in their research or in their academic pursuits, are always innovating and expanding the envelope uh, beyond what the technology was either intended for or is ideally suited for. And um, leveraging that to our success really paid off. So I see that regularly. IU, 15 years ago, implemented e-text. Mm. Uh, and if, if you remember your first e-text, if it was, you know, maybe a Kindle at the time, yeah. yes, it was very impressive trying to find a book. You know, the publishers hadn't fully embraced that. Uh, and so, again, it was that faculty, researcher, academic, pioneering nature of seeing that this was going to be something relative to the future. And now some 15 years later, the majority of our courses have electronic text equivalents. Mm -hmm which improves access for our students, lowers the cost of attendance uh, substantially. And we've tracked almost $100 million in savings for students over that 15 year period compared to if they were buying the traditional printed text. Wow. That's remarkable. So you know, just great examples where our faculty come together in ways really to identify the technologies that are gonna be innovative and helpful for the student experience. Um, to enable them to be prepared for that either career or that next phase in their life. Curious and given the pace of the, the innovation that's happening and across so many disciplines that are served here in the university space, how do you personally just keep up with all that's happening? It's impossible, I don't. <laughs> I, I <laughs> It sounds exhausting. So, you know, there's only one constant in technology and that's change. Yeah. Um, the pace of change I would say, you know, having been in technology, both in the military and in my career in higher education, you know, there's always a high pace of change with technology. Things that kids today were born always having access to didn't exist five years prior in any way, shape or form. Um, and so, you know, you have to enjoy the pace of change because if you get frustrated with it, it's the wrong industry to be in. Um, and I think the other thing I do is I'm curious by nature mm -hmm. and I just embrace that in throwing myself at the things because I want to experience the change before I ever am promoting that to my colleagues um, or, you know, imposing something that I haven't gone through if, if possible for me to do so um, because it is disorienting. It, it's, it's, it can be comfortable to kind of get stuck in the, I like using this the way it is. And I mean, Windows 7 might have been your favorite thing. But uh, hopefully some of the innovations since then have uh, improved your experiences. But, you know, I, I do always deeply keep seated in my mind that as excited as I might be that it can do this, that or the other. It is a change and um, we have to be sensitive to that as we deploy it. I mean, there's privacy concerns. There's the ethical concerns. Uh, you know, there's policy and law, um, you know, which country owns this product and what are the regulations around this, that or the other. So, you know, I, I think having a deep root in sensitivity and almost empathy to I'm always going to throw myself into it because not because I'm a zealot for suffering, um, but rather always keep in mind of all of us are constantly going through this. Yeah, that makes sense. And I think you're you're jumping right to the kind of next question about how do you evaluate when you're in that position of where are we going to make the investments? What are we going to buy? 
what direction are we taking our digital adoption and how do you make those decisions? What does that look and sound like? It's a great question. Um, I would say that IU has really had a culture of evaluating three core options every time it comes to any new technology. Um, and so you hear buy versus build quite frequently. And we, we insert a third, which is borrow. Um, borrow is not a bad thing. So, you know, we'll buy when the industry is producing something that's of merit and the price is right. Um, and so, you know, whether that is when it reaches full commodity or let's say somebody has introduced something in the marketplace that's so unique that we could never catch up in the built side. Um, pandemic was a great example of there were many opportunities where IU chose to build because we could do it faster. The market didn't have a you know catalog of products on here's your toolkit for a global pandemic. Um, so we developed a lot of those ourselves in house and that got us resolution far faster. Mm -hmm. Um, and in ideal situations, we move those in partnership with the state from innovation to to the market, um, you know, through things like tech transfer. Yep. So the borrow space really is one of the beauties of higher education. As much as we might compete with each other on the sports field and we all want to win the championship for whatever the event might be. And we want to you know win the most grants and win the most students and have all the successes. Um, it is really a community of collaboration. And so oftentimes, because higher ed is not as large a vertical as some other verticals uh, in industry, somebody solved the problem. It might be at another a fellow Big Ten school, or maybe IU happened to be the first to solve this. And, uh, you know, we can partner, we can collaborate. It's really at the core of the academic mission. Researchers would tell you they've been doing this for decades upon decades. You know, you and I could be in the same research industry and you've got an epiphany on this aspect of it. And I have one on that. And why wouldn't we collaborate together? We can be two, three times as effective as we are independently. Um, and so that borrow space is something that we look at. So I would say in every scenario, we assess what the sourcing options are and which one best fits the needs of the university at the time. Great to hear. Sounds very in tune to the Hoosier DNA of collaborating with It is. Make that dollar spend like three. Yes. Yes. I love that. Um, well, to wrap up, I'm curious, three to five years from now, what you see on the horizon? What do you think is going to continue to be disruptive in higher ed? Well, I mean, clearly there's, there's no way to have a conversation today about what the impact of artificial intelligence is. And, um, you know, whether you're a skeptic or you're, you know, completely bought in or somewhere in between. I would tell you that it is going to be one of the most dif disruptive technologies that we've experienced. I would say that it is on parallel to the internet. Um, it is going to be in everything, everywhere. And I think the other thing that's going to amaze folks is the pace at which it's already a part of many things that you do, whether you realize it or not. Um, and so I can't, I can't see a three to five year horizon without that. And I think when you think about that as one of the core disruptors over the next three to five years, technology has a way of repeating itself in certain aspects. And so, um, you know, I just was at a conference with Michael Dell um, from uh, Dell Corporation and, uh, and literally the last two weeks. And one of the things that Michael and the industry was, was seeing was, uh, you know, this, this equipment on site used to be the trend 15 years ago. And then cloud was, was at least a great marketing buzz, but everybody moved everything to the cloud and they started divesting themselves of physical assets. AI, more so than not, you're going to see those physical assets become, uh, come back to your local area. So you think about in retail where the data is happening real time so fast at point of sale, at point of interaction. Um, you see an in industry like shipping and manufacturing. I need all the data about everything. In fact, I need to know where all these resources came to make these parts before I assemble them. How did they ship? Where did they ship from? Why is this one six seconds behind this one? And you're going to need to calculate and crunch all that as close to the point of the inception of the data you don't want to send the data off to another location because the time and cost associated with sending it out and then calculating it out and then sending it back. You want it right there. So Dell um, is just one one of our partner manufacturers. 
um, is looking at that and already seeing a huge uptick in the localized deployments um, of systems. Uh, NVIDIA, another, um, where they're seeing more and more of this kind of shift. So it's, you know, what was new 10 years ago is kind of shifted, and now we're seeing a repeat of, of some of those aspects of it. So, you know, AI being at the source of it, at least this go around, who knows in five years what the, <laughs> what the next thing will be, but I just can't, I can't fathom that, especially over the next three to five years, that that won't be substantial. We'll be using it in research. We'll be using it, you know, I wouldn't be surprised in three years as, as you and I sit here to talk, mm -hmm. we've got AI behind us listening and giving us suggestions on, Rob, that really wasn't the right thing to say. You should have said it this way. And, you know, it's not that we would just, sense. yeah, and not that we would just take 100% of that, but that it would collaborate with us in ways that would help us be um, even more effective in whatever the role is that we might be doing. And, and I think we'll see it begin to be integrated into the products that we're already using in ways that um, are much more seamless. You know, when I think about something like a web browser and searching the web, um, somebody that lived through that experience, and I can tell you in the early days, you really had to be focused on what you were searching for. And if you didn't use the words in the exact ways that it was captured, your results varied. I just learned in the last week that there's actually a second page on the Google search results. If you go to the bottom, there's, oh. a, there's a second yes. page. Okay. I never knew that. <laughs> you know, 90 plus percent of folks click on the first three links because we've become so proficient in how we search. And this next iteration with AI integrated, whether you see it through Microsoft and Bing, um, Google and Bard, I think it's going to, again, it's going to elevate the scholarly records that are available to us, all the information, the data. It's gonna be more the way we interact mm -hmm. with the technology versus us having to train ourselves on how to specifically type that search to get the exact answers I'm looking for um, and I think that will spawn more creativity from us. Um, and I think that will create greater efficiencies and, and a more competitive outcome in the things that we're interested in accomplishing. So interesting. It will undoubtedly be a wild ride. It will. But I'm looking forward to it. And let's commit to redoing this in three to five years. Let's see how that Absolutely moves Absolutely how wrong I was. <laughs> All of it. Well, thank you so much for spending time with yeah, us. Thank you. I appreciate your time.